Welcome to Fractal Aerodynamics. This is a video podcast discussing a new approach describing fluid dynamics. My name is Felix Schaller and I'm the host of this channel. Before you watch this episode, I recommend you to start with the introducing chapter who gives a comprehensive overview over the content of this channel. In the second chapter, we will develop a solution for all these open questions that came up in the preceding chapter discussing lift theories. So let's start and create our model simulating lift. But let me shortly rephrase the content of the last chapter in the beginning. We saw that the Bernoulli principle on which the potential theory is based on does not produce any lift. The Kudai-Shukovsky method uses additional rotating potentials to describe lift. Newton-based theories describe lift but only the final result in the role of downwash. All theories do not include flow separation in their solution, which actually is the effect that leads to the secret of lift. This means that we need a model that can describe all effects of aerodynamics, not just parts of it. We begin the development by creating a simple simulation which has isolated certain effects in fluid mechanics. From that we enhance the model in any step gradually. With this procedure, we can separate different effects and reveal the inner mechanics that drives the fluid. So we start with a simple finite element simulation where we can design our model step by step. By that we can look under the hood of the aerodynamics nature. We begin with the development by creating a simple simulation which has isolated certain effects in fluid mechanics. From that we enhance our model in any step gradually. With this procedure we can separate different effects and reveal the inner mechanics that drives the fluid. First we start with elements that have no interaction with each other at all. Only wall collisions and obstacle collisions are allowed. What we first see is that the, our simplified wing in this shape of a simple plate creates a wind shadow with a vacuum in it. The vacuum is an area where the finite elements experience no opposing force. So all force on the particles would thus come from the free stream around, which is the area where the particles move. If we add self-collisions to the element, it's getting closer to what we would expect. Imagine a stream of sand particles that flows around the wing. Only collisions and self-collisions deflect the particles. We still have a vacuum area in the wind shadow, but it closes already a bit. Finally, it gets interesting when we add pressure to the model. The finite elements repel each other like on a real fluid under pressure. It's a loose feather mass system representing quantified physical behavior of mass with an additional density or compressible potential. And indeed, we can observe the same effects of what can be observed on a wing. We have deflection and global downwash. At higher angle of attack, the stream creates a reverse flow. Subsequently, turbulent separation happens just the way we know it from real examples. Let's analyze the simulation in detail. We can see in our primitive wing that a vacuum remains right after the leading edge on top of our primitive wing, but only for a short section because the pressure of the fluid manages to accelerate the fluid back to the surface and closes the gap. Thereby the fluid is stimulated to follow a convex surface that escapes from the stream. As we can see, this has also an effect on the speed, while on the lower side the particles get deflected by repelling on the surface. 
the particles get squeezed together which leads to a slowdown of the fluid speed without the presence of surface friction. Instead, on the upper side, the particles have space to expand, which leads to a fluid acceleration. This shows that speed difference between the lower and the upper side is rather an effect, not a cause for lift. So what happens when the surface escapes from the streamline? Space gets cleared in between. Because all fluids and gases exist under pressure, the surrounding pressure potential provides the energy to accelerate the fluid back to the surface, but with a certain latency. The reason is mass inertia of the air. All forces in the physical world tend to equilibrate. The air would like to stream in the free gap the bubble underneath here. But according to the laws of motion and inertia this can't happen. Only on a certain ratio radius of deflection. In this case the gap between the stream and the surface is too small that the fluid can turn around inside the gap and could compensate the unbalanced forces. This means that the only possible solution is that the flow has to attach parallel to the surface and follow its tra trajectory. Depending on the speed of the flow, the radius of deflection changes based on the laws of centripetal forces and mass inertia. That's why all airplane profiles are differently shaped according to their range of operation. Let's compare this to, with real experiments from wind tunnels. As we can see that the bubble lays right behind the leading edge where the stream tries to follow the surface, but it can't. Only after a certain distance the flow is able to attach again straight to the surface to flow in its direction. But if the angle of the attack rises, the stream no longer is able to attach to the surface and creates a reverse flow. This is the point where the fluid has gained ra a radius big enough so it managed to flow inside the bubble. In a schematic way it looks like this. Because of the strong trajectory of the surface, the stream is unable to follow its curvature. The bubble grows to a size where the detachment of the stream is big enough that the minimal possible radius hits the surface again in an orthogonal angle. At this point the stream has the opportunity to enter the bubble. In consequence the bubble collapses and low pressure gets lost and parts of the bubble detach as vortices. At this point less low pressure can be established, which means less deflection of the stream, finally leading to pure drag. Here again real world wind tunnel experiments show the same behavior than observed in our model. Low pressure gets eaten up by reverse flow entering the bubble. This makes the stream impossible to attach. With this example we can also clearly see how much the right curvature of the surface matters in terms of flow deflection. One little bump creates disturbance and local pressure peaks. If those peaks exceed a certain threshold, the flow has enough pressure difference that the fluid can be deflected and revolve, leading to the result that more and more turbulence gets induced. In aerodynamics today, it's claimed that turbulent effects only happen because of the existence of boundary layer. Here we can already see it happens without these circumstances.
and we will see in later sessions why. So the smoother the surface, the less pressure peaks are created, right? This could very likely mislead to wrong conclusions, that perfect smoothness is the key. But we will also see in later chapters it doesn't count, especially in matters of friction. Boundary layer and no slip condition is not the only reason for turbulence. The main reason is shape and the fluid which requests a certain ideal body to interact with. The key to optimal lift is steady deflection, that the fluid does not become unstable. So if that ideal counterpart is not present in the shape, we have to deal with the problem that it is called rigid boundary condition. Local pressure indifference occur. In compensation the fluid has to create revolving turbulence to fill mechanical inequalities. Turbulence is one major source of drag and therefore it's aimed to be avoided. In conclusion we can see that lift is less an effect of speed difference as explained with Bernoulli and the potential theory and also not the combination of several potentials. The potential theory is also not really helpful at all here and as part of our most central statements not correct for fluid behavior. Other conclusions by that approach are that the shape of the surface is highly speed dependent. This is also the reason why every aerodynamic operation range requires its own profile shape. We will give those features a special attention in later chapters. Where else can we see this effect in operation? Cavitation is also a good example showing the relation of environment pressure versus flow deflection. When the pressure drops under a certain level, the fluid changes its aggregation stage. It's kind of a stage just before absolute vacuum. Only with some side effects that it changes aggregation state first. But this effect provides us a good example to demonstrate what happens when fluid is deflected around edges too sharply. Now let's summarize this chapter. We saw that how Atmospheric pressure is responsible so that the air attaches on the upper surface. And that its behavior is strongly related to the curvature of the surface, so the pressure is able to accelerate the air accordingly. If the free stream is detached too far from the surface, the air can revolve inside the bubble and let it collapse. The behavior is speed dependent due to the loss of motion and mass inertia. The air can be accelerated only on a steady track. Lift is thus an unstable phenomenon. It is related to the matter how much the air can be forced to attach on convex surfaces. The stronger the def deflection, the more the attachment becomes unstable and the flow can complete its formation of vortices. So by coming back to the rotating potential phenomenon from the last chapter, we can finally say that lift is a vortex that is hindered on its completion. And it finally formates when stall occurs. That's so far for this chapter. I hope you liked it. In the next chapter we will debunk Bernoulli's law and lay out the misconception that come with the odds of the potential theory. See you there!